Fantastic. Right, well, those of you that are on, welcome. Um, and thanks for joining us. We just thought it would be a good idea. Um, Rosie and I, um, like the rest of you, um, with this time of the year, we'll be uh, thinking about playing the game of cricket. We'd be thinking about the challenges ahead. Um, but unfortunately, with, uh, with what's going on, that's not possible. So we thought it would be a good idea um, to start a few, uh, a few weekly uh, catch-ups. Um, and Rosie, um, normally you'd have played a few games, a few practice games, a few friendlies, a few championship games. First year of being captain of the club. What have you been doing for the last few weeks? Um, probably the same as what everyone else in this chat has been doing, I think. Um, pretty much nothing, trying to stay fit. Um, you know, obviously it's a disappointing time, isn't it? You know, we'd, like you say, we'd have probably had four or five championship games now. So a lot of cricket we've missed out on. Um, you know, we cut, cut short La Manga to, to get home, which was obviously disappointing. But um, yes, yeah, same as everyone else has been doing, pretty much nothing. Long walks and spending time with the family, really. So the, the one thing that obviously the players have been able to do and the one thing that we've encouraged you all to do is maintain physical fitness, which, you know, that, that's, you know, you, you're all um, decent uh, young men with decent athleticism. So that's not been too difficult. Um, what, what have you been doing week by week in terms of fitness work? Um, yeah, quite a bit, to be honest. I think it's, it's obviously a good opportunity to, to keep our levels up. You know, we, you work hard four or five months through the winter um you know to get those levels high you know when you're sort of running up hills in December you never think the season's going to be here and you know we're now in May and we still don't know when the season's going to be so you may as well you know control the things that you can control and that is the fitness so we've been checking in with with Jack Murphy in the SNC um he's been really good you know sending out workouts you know a lot of us you know have got some sort of weights at home you know we don't have a home gym though so um, unless you're probably Belly who's you know got a load of cash then it's all right for him but you know for everyone else it's you know who's just a normal bloke you know we've probably got a kettlebell and a med ball that's all about it so um, yeah just coming up with inventive ways to you know keep muscle mass and, and stay fit but obviously you know the luxury of, of going out on the roads and running um, you know is, is obviously perfect for us. And what, uh, what about the the the, the mental challenge I mean you know I, I said right at the start of this we we would all normally be involved in, in cricket in some way. One of the reasons that we all got involved in cricket is we love the team side of it. We, we've all found our level, whether that's, you know, you playing for Warwickshire, captain in Warwickshire, whether that's, you know, a good club cricketer, a, a second team club, it doesn't matter. We all have a level that we play to. But and one of the things that brought us into it is actually the team side of things. So not being in a team environment, and being, you know, if you like, locked away at home, the mental challenge of that for a professional sportsman, challenging? Yeah, very. Um, there's obviously a lot of things to do around the house. I'm sure, you know, if you've got wives, girlfriends, families, you know, you've all of a sudden started cleaning. I've cleaned a lot of dishes over the last seven weeks. Um, <laughs> I've cut a lot of grass. I've done a lot of gardening, things that you always try. trying to at least I've got an unbelievable looking garden now which is you know nice um but yeah it is, it is mentally tough you know that I think the the sort of fear of the unknown and not knowing when you a can go back to train or b knowing when you can actually play a game is is probably the worst thing about it you know I think for the first few weeks it was probably quite nice because you don't spend you know as much time as at home as sometimes you'd like in the summer but you know now we want to get back out playing and obviously safety comes first and, you know, with everything that's going on, it's, you know, it's sort of ticking away. Um, and every day we sort of go by now is, is a day lost, you know, that we could be playing. So, yeah, it's, it is mentally, you know, pretty draining, but, you know, that's the things that we've got to, you know, use. And obviously with the guidelines now where we can go see one person, whether that's just seeing, you know, someone in your family or seeing someone from the squad and just have a chat for an hour, two hours or whatever. It's, you know, it's, you know, nice that it's progressing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I said, you know, last year when I came out of the England setup, one of the reasons that I did that was I wanted a bit of normality, a bit more time at home. Well, I've never spent so much time at home. So, uh, you know, in, in the last 
eight years to have spent what, six weeks at home in one block. I don't think I've ever done that before. Um, so, you know, maybe I've uh, got what I wish for, but maybe not in the circumstances. And, you know, and, and look, we can spend all night talking about coronavirus. We, we take it, you know, the absolute, as you said there, it's about doing the right thing, you know, and, it, you know, crikey, when so many thousands of people have lost their lives, you know, this isn't something that we're taking lightly. We're taking government advice. Um, but just for an hour tonight, we're going to try and put the coronavirus to one side. We, we know we, we're not going to make light of that in any way whatsoever. Um, but it, it is a chance to chat cricket. We'll start off with just a bit of conversation as we are with you and I. And then feel free, anybody that's got questions, um, you know, I think there's a, a chat line, chat way that you can sort of drop your questions into. And we can pick questions off if you want to type them through. If you want to raise your hand, if you go onto the participants bit at the bottom, there's a button you can push, raise hand, and then we can come to you and you can uh, you can ask your question. And, and we're happy to to answer anything, William. I think, aren't we? Absolutely anything. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I think so. Just just about. Yeah, I think so. Fantastic. We're, we're, the the great thing is for you over the last few weeks, every Saturday has been a good Saturday because whole city of I've obviously not been losing, so uh, that that's been a good Saturday for you. Um, but yeah. no sport to watch on television. Um, the, the one thing I would take you back to, though, a few weeks ago you went to Pakistan, um, yeah. and there was a TV program I watched on Sky the other night about the the return to Lahore, which you know for me, um, having been involved in you know the, the terrible situation in Lahore, to see you guys go there and to see you play, and I, I genuinely was moved by the program and I, and I thoroughly enjoy watching the Sky program. Anyone who hasn't seen it and gets opportunity to watch it, I, I would really, really encourage you to watch it. One, how much did you enjoy it? And two, how important for the game was it that you, with the MCC, went back to Pakistan to play some cricket? Yeah, absolutely. I think first and foremost, it's, um, you know, the, the safety aspect was, you know, all of a sudden just sort of eradicated really you know the amount of security we had um coming out of the airport was you know I've, I've never seen anything like that before um so i think once you get that sort of um you know knowledge that you're going to be safe um it was was obviously fantastic and then you can enjoy the tour um the tour on the whole was was fantastic you know we were there for a week um you know we'd have probably liked to have been there for two weeks you know it was quite a cramped tour um but yeah I think three twenty twenties in a one day game. Um, absolutely brilliant, brilliant experience to go away. You know, I've been lucky enough to go to India, Sri Lanka, uh, Bangladesh as well. So, you know, being used to the, the conditions over there, but Pakistan just seemed to be a lot different. Um, it was actually quite um, westernised the the sort of pitches um, and, and the facilities as well, um, which I, which actually took a few of us by surprise. I think, which was you know quite nice to see. You know, they've obviously put a lot of time and effort in over the last. 10, 11 years since, you know, obviously the attacks happened. So, um, you know, it was a brilliant place to play. You know, I'd certainly go back, you know, given the opportunity. Um, you know, regards to your second question, I think it's huge for, for cricket to go back there. Um, I think, like it said on the on the programme, you know, they've, they've sort of been in exile, haven't they, in, in Dubai and, you know, the UAE. So, um, you know, the first game we played there, there was 20, 25,000 people in the hall at the uh, Gaddafi Stadium, which... I've never heard a noise like that. Um, you know, I've played in front of that many people, um, whether it's, you know, in a Roses game, whether it's in a, a Bears v Pairs T20, but the noise in that stadium that night was was just electric. Um, and you could see the passion and love that they um, show for the game. And, you know, I think it's, you know, only a matter of time before regular cricket's there. And, yeah, it should be, you know, a very good experience for, for anyone who goes there. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. And obviously, you know, as I say, I had first-hand experience of that Lahore incident. I, I remember being there with Sri Lanka on a previous tour and we were playing a one-day game against Pakistan in Karachi. And um, Afridi was in his pomp and Pakistan needed about 120 to win off 18 overs since one-day game. Afridi came in, 45 to 50,000, absolute frenzy, cheering him all the way to the middle. He got out first ball, caught long off. And I reckon three quarters of the stadium emptied as he was leaving the pitch. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, it, it is, it, I mean, you said you've been to you know, all of the Asian countries. It, it is more than a game 
for them. And, and to think that someone like Azar Ali has played, what, 50 test matches and never played a test match in Pakistan, you know, for the kids growing up to have their own heroes playing in front of them in their tough times, it really is important that cricket goes back there, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, someone like Azarelli, you know, Yasser Shah as well, I don't think he's played a game there as well. And he's taken 300 test wickets. I think, you know, these guys are superstars in, in their eyes. Um, you know, I think there was a similar story when Kumar Sankar got out for us. And I think there's about three people left in the stadium when Mike Burgess hit the winning runs. And that's, I know it shows the <laughs> colour of a player, but um, yeah, obviously no one's come to watch me and Burge, but they've come to watch you know, one man and, you know, when he got out, everyone left. So, um, but yeah, amazing experience to, to play there. Um, and, and like I said before, it's, you know, just a shame that, you know, it's sort of been away for, for 10 years. Um, and, you know, it will, it will take a big team like England, New Zealand, Australia to go back there and have a big tour there and, um, you know, for them to be, you know, well and truly back on the, on the cricket map again. Yeah, absolutely. And let, let's hope that happens soon. It, let, let's, We'll stay on the, the overseas theme. Dom Sibley, obviously everybody on this um, call will have followed um, Sibs over the last um, couple of years. You, you've had the pleasure of opening the batting with him and, and forming a fantastic opening partnership. Um, at the start of the winter, he went to New Zealand, played test cricket, and everybody, all the media said, he can't play test cricket with that technique. Um, by the end of the winter and South Africa, people were saying, we think we found our opener for the next few years in the England team. It's amazing how quickly the perception and the mood can change around a player playing international cricket. I mean, you saw it, you know, at Yorkshire, yeah. you saw the likes of Bairstow, Root, um, Balance going off to play for England. You've now seen, obviously, Sibs um, going to do that. Um, when, when you're watching someone like Sibs, you know, do you see an England international batting with the other end? Um, and have you been surprised by how well he's done over the course of this winter? I don't think so. No, I think anyone who who scores the amount of runs he did uh, in a year, um, especially when I don't think anyone got near 900 runs, did they? Maybe nine, one person got 900 runs in the last year, not 1,400. I think anyone who you know, has got that big a gap is obviously made to go higher. Um, you know, when you when you see him bat, um, I can remember coming back from Australia last year when I played club cricket out there. And I came to watch him bat in, in the first net I saw and I just, his presence at the crease had changed over the winter. Um, I think whether that's a confidence thing from, you know, scoring 300s in his last three innings of the previous year to then changing a little bit of work, you know, as you do in the winter, and then he comes in and gets 100 in the MCC game. Um, his presence at the crease was just amazing. Um, and then he takes that into the first game, or second game, I think we played Hampshire. Um, and we were facing Fiddle Edwards, Carl Abbott, two amazing bowlers. And I thought we're bowling pretty quick. Um, so I'm sort of not jump, jumping around a little bit, I guess, and getting my beans going. You see him face them, and he just makes it very look so slow. Um, and that's when you know he's in a good place and someone can go play higher, you know, when they've got that time in, in, in county cricket to, to to manipulate very good bowlers. Um, so there's absolutely no doubt that he could play higher and, and, have, a, and have a good career. You know, his technique is his technique. You know, I've seen him since he was 14, 15 years old and he's pretty much had that same technique for 10 years and it's clearly worked for him. It worked for him when he was 18, when he got 240 against Yorkshire and, you know, it's, it's been working for us for two years. So... There's no reason, obviously, everyone needs to tinker and, and change a little bit, but to change a massive amount isn't, um, you know, isn't really necessary. I think it's just whether you can block out the media and, and stuff like that in your head. Um, that'll probably be his biggest challenge. Um, and, and, you know, at the minute, he's, he's going well. So, long may that continue. And, and when, when, a, when a player has that, um, you know, that, that sort of speculation, that intense view from the media... Um, you know, as I said, you, you've been around players that have played for England. You've seen that. You've seen players at Yorkshire get selected for England, come back because they've been left out. You know, you've seen that, you know, at Warwickshire in your time as well. But how much of a of a challenge is that for players with the media and the amount of media coverage there is on their techniques in particular? 
Yeah, it's huge. I think that's the almost the biggest burden on the game, isn't it? At the minute, is the media and and how much you listen to. Um, you know, the best players will always back their techniques and back what their closest coaches tell them. Um, you know, if you think you're doing the right thing, then you know you probably are. Um, but it's just having that clarity to to do it um, and having the coaches around you that support you. Um, you know, I I was obviously in. A, Talking about myself, I was I was wanting a great place um, after the one day competition this year. So I went back to an old coach at Yorkshire and just had an hour's conversation with him. Um, it can be anything. It could be a club coach. Um, you know, sometimes the best person is is either for me is sometimes my old man. Um, you know, he never actually coached me as such, but probably knows the game best out of anyone. So it's about going back to people who you know and who are close to you, and I think that's what the best people do. You know. Gary Balance was a was a prime example of that, you know. Started his career like a house on fire. Struggled a bit for a year, went back to county cricket and, you know, scored a, a shed loads of runs back in the England team and, and stuff like that. Didn't really worry about his technique. He knew, you know, if he sort of did the right things and prepared well, then he would get back in the England team, you know, no doubt. So, um, you know, it's just about having those coaches around you and backing yourself to to go to that next level because there is such a gap between county cricket and, you know, the, the level above. Interesting you say that about going back to a former coach. And I've told this story quite a few times. I was with Sri Lanka. We were playing England in a test series in Sri Lanka. And I went up to Kandy, travelled up with Sangakara, and I had an ear infection. He took me to a local hospital, got my ears sorted, and he said, we're just going to go to my dad's on the way back to the hotel. And his mum and dad live in Candy, and we went to his mum and dad's and had a cup of tea. And then we went to this local park, a little concrete strip, and him and his dad got a ball and a bat out. And his dad threw at him for about 20 minutes. And Sanga just lined a few up, played a few shots, they had a chat. We got back in the car, went to the hotel, and I said, um, What was that? He said, Oh, he said, oh, Every so often I just check in with my dad. He said, He knows my game better than anyone. And it was just a bit of a check in. And he said, I speak to my dad from all over the world. And uh, he said, he doesn't necessarily talk to me about technique. He talks to me about my intent and how he sees me moving. And he can tell whether I'm thinking about too many things just from the way that I'm moving. So, you know, you're absolutely right. It worked for you. What, what did you chat about then? So the, you went back to your coach that you'd worked with yeah. in Yorkshire, someone that has known you for quite a long time, I'm guessing through your younger period. What sort of things do you talk about when you chat to a coach in that situation? Yeah, I just I just spoke to him. I just asked him, you know, a few just a few simple questions, really. You know, um, you know, what do I do well when I'm playing at my best? Um, what does it look like when I'm playing at my worst? A couple of very simple things, um, and then you send him a a video of what your you know of your previous innings or something like that, and he and he just sort of will pick two balls, maybe where you've done something well and where you've done something poorly, and you know you can then revert to that, put it on a split screen, and see what you're doing. You know, you know, you know Richard Dams uh, very well, Fabs, and he's a very black and white character, isn't he? He'll tell you, he's, he's more than happy to tell you if you're rubbish in a, in a nice way, but yeah. then he's, he's more than happy to tell you if you're the world's greatest player. And, you know, he will always, you know, have your best interests at heart. So for me, you know, if I show him a ball, he'll go, no, nah, that's not you at all. That's, you know, that's the old roadie or whatever. He'll show him yeah. another ball and go, that is, that's you at your best. Um, so just take that in with you um, and it's just simple things really um, obviously that's not to say that the coaches at Warwickshire you know at my cup of tea they're obviously everyone is but you you know you have you, you have your old coaches who you know for me Damage I've been working or I've worked with since I was 15 years old to when I was 22 so you know obviously it takes a long time to build a relationship with a coach I, I personally feel um, so yeah. you know he, he he's seen my game evolve the most you know from when you are a kid to a first division cricketer, I think that you know, st gradual step is is when the coach sees sort of the most changes to your game. Yeah, no, absolutely, and you're right. I mean, it's not a, you know, it's not a slight on anybody that you're working with at Warwickshire, and I, and I, you know, I've seen many players. Um, you know, when I first got involved in the England setup, Josh Butler used to chat to Kevin Peterson a lot about his game. Um, you know, and and a lot of players revert back to players they play with. I'm interested in. You know, we, we, we both saw root balance best. I mentioned them earlier. We, we, we saw them as younger players. Players, when I first went to Yorkshire, 
that they sort of Bearstow and Root had played a little bit of England cricket, um, but that they there wasn't necessarily for me the signs that Root was going to be the player that he's turned into. I thought Balance was going to be a fantastic England player because mentally he was so strong. Um, just watching watching those three, what what is it about Root that's made Root the the, the world class player that he is? I think first and foremost, it's his desire to to get better. I think you know, you know, when you have a player that good who come back into a county set up, you know, for for Warwickshire, it's works, isn't it? Whenever you get someone that good who has played that level, they always the the sort of attitude to get better is is you know different gravy to everyone else. Um, you know, you'd see Rooty take as much time in the nets as he wanted as what he felt was right, you know, whether you get half an hour or an hour in the nets, you know, pre-game, um, he would always stay behind and, and work on something that, you know, he maybe got out in, um, you know, the previous game and he would nail that until he felt comfortable that it wasn't going to happen in the next game. Um, little things like that, you know, the attention to detail um, was so critical with those top, top players. And, you know, whether it's, you know, obviously cricket is a, is a game of fine margins and, you know, millimetres, you know, can cost you your innings or whatever. And it's, you know, the perfecting those, you know, those attention to detail is what makes, you know, especially Rooty, one of the best, well, one of the best players in the world. Right, let's move on to your, your captaincy. So you, you've been appointed captain. What, and this is, a, this is a tricky question because obviously you haven't captained a game for Warwickshire yet. I know that you've captained games at Yorkshire and I obviously had the pleasure of working with you at Yorkshire. What sort of captain do you reckon you're going to be? So before the season starts, what sort yeah. of captain are you going to be? And at the end of the season, if we play some cricket, what will your benchmarkers be to say, "Yeah, I'm going all right"? What What are you What, what are you going to What do you think your your key things are going to be as a captain? Um, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's a tough question. I think when I was younger, I think I was a very extrovert captain not so much a sh not a shouter as such but someone who was quite vocal on the field um whereas I think now I think I'll be the other way I think I, I, I believe I think about the game a lot more um take a lot in from my surroundings use senior players in, in the team that I trust and I, and I value their opinions a lot more than probably what I did when I was younger so you know I'd probably be more of a thinker than a shatter um so I think that's Hopefully, the way I'll, I'll go, um, you know, be a, be a calming influence on people, you know, try and lead by example where, where possible, um, you know, with performances. Um, you know, at the end of the season, you know, the benchmarks, are, you know, if everyone can come off and, you know, say that I've, I've done that, you know, I've calmed them down on the pitch, you know, and tried to get the best out of them, you know, every, every single player is different. You know, we, we've spoke about this, you know, you've got some guys in the team who, you can leave to their own devices. Someone like Dom Sibley, someone like uh, an Ollie Hannon Dolby, um, you know, who know the game. They're a little bit older. They played more cricket, um, you know. And then you've got people like Henry Brooks. You've got people like Ollie Stone, who, you know, you've got to pump their tyres up. Tell them, you know, they're the quickest bowler in the world. Tell them they're the best bowler in the world, and that'll be the way you go with them. So I think it's a lot of man management, um, especially when you get to the top level. So, you know, for, for the end of the season, for the guys to say that I've, you know, captained them well and managed them well will be a, will be a sign that we're going in the right direction. And obviously winning games of cricket, you know, if you, it's all well and good doing that. Um, but if you finish 10th in the championship, then, you know, there's probably going to be a lot of people like yourself that I've got to answer to. So uh, <laughs> it certainly will be. <laughs> got to, uh, got to at least finish eighth, I think. Um, that, you know, obviously, win games of cricket is the um, is the is the priority. Yeah, absolutely. J just, I mean, in terms of, um, and you're right. I mean, we we've obviously spent a lot of time talking about the captaincy role and, and you in particular. You know, you touched on it. Then, for me as a coach, understanding your players, everybody needs something different from you as a coach. And it'll be exactly the same as a captain. So understanding the people that are in your team and understanding how you're going to get the best out of them. I'm guessing that's something you spent a little bit of time thinking about the different individuals and how you're actually going to get the best out of them. Yeah, correct. I, I think a lot of this winter, um, you know, we 
generally know a lot of you know we know a lot about each other you know when you spend day in day out with each other you, you know each other's games pretty well but it's actually knowing the player behind the game um, and this winter I, you know there's been a lot of emphasis on me you know speaking to these lads and you know whether it's role clarification whether it's where they see themselves coming into the team whether it's you know how I see them in the team you know it's actually just you know speaking to those lads putting in that work and then at least they know that I'm being straight up and honest you know when the season comes around so knowing, knowing your players is obviously a massive massive thing in any team and I think that's the responsibility of you know like you say the coaches but also the captain because you know at the end of the day we've got to go out on the field and, and get results and you know if I've, I've got plans of you know certain people and you know they're thinking different then you know you're never going to win games of cricket so we've got to come up with game plans you know that that fit everyone in really role clarification that's that's something that we hear a lot about you know that that gets trotted out a lot from from players i hear coaches um talking about it i mean you're not a cliche user i i, I would hope that i'm not um but we do hear people talking in cliches we hear Managers, coaches after football and cricket matches, you know, trotting out loads of cliches, but role clarity, role clarification. Just give us a, an insight from a, a modern player, exactly what they want to know from you as a captain or me as a coach. What do they want to know from us? I think it, I think it comes into to all three forms of the game, really. You know, I, the reason why I'm quite big on it is because I, I feel my time at Yorkshire was you know, pretty tough. And I've seen it with a lot of young players where you get, you know, almost shafted a little bit. You know, you you end up filling in four people. Um, you know, there was four game cham- championship games at Yorkshire where, where I first came into the team and, you know, I went from opening the batting and not bowling to then being the fourth team uh, and batting eight and then going back to open the batting and then coming back down to, to eight. And obviously that's, mentally, that's not great on a cricketer because, you know, you've got to open the batting, you know, against some high quality cricketers in, in Div 1 and then you might be bowling 25 overs the next game so for me it's almost about just saying to the guys look if this this is where I see you batting where do you see yourself batting and then you come to you know some sort of judgement whether it's with the ball um, you know it could be someone like Stoney um, it could be sort of right you're going to bowl five overs quick as you can um, and try and ruffle a few you know a few feathers or it could be to you know, Liam Norwell, right, I want a couple of long spells out of you and, and hit top of off just consistently. Um, you know, and, and you sort of get you sort of know what people want to do. Um, because at the end of the day, for the bowlers, especially, you know, they're sort of more in control of what they can do as as opposed to batsmen. So um, you know, having that sort of similarity in thought to your to your big quicks, um, you know, is obviously key to to getting that that royal clarity sort. Excellent. Brilliant. Look, I'm sure there are questions uh, and I, Steve Coots has got his hand up and he's had it up for a while, whether that was just testing to see if it works. But Steve, if you can hear us, have you got a question? Yeah. Yeah. Paul and Will, we go. interesting conversation. I really, really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, so I'm Steve Coots, uh, Stratford upon Avon Cricket Club. Um, as you said at the beginning, Paul, you know, what we, what we really are missing at the moment, I think, is that camaraderie and the team spirit. It's why we play sport. You know, this will be something like my 49th season. Um, I haven't been able to play all of those years because I, I lived abroad for a while working, but I got back into the cricket here, been in Stratford for about 13, 14 years now. I think, as you guys know, we've spoken in the past. Uh, um, you know, I've been on the committee for a while, around the club for a little while. Um, the cricket, the playing the cricket is, is important to me, but being with the, with the lads is, is even more important, particularly when you're in your 50s and, you know, you're not playing your best cricket in your life. So, so getting out and being with the lads is important. Um, I don't know whether, uh, you know, and I apologise in advance that the question is coronavirus related, but I don't know whether or not the amateur game is going to be given a chance to get going this season because... Again, you know, being on the committee and really looking after the commercial side of the club, and trying to make sure that we've got money in the bank and we, we're able to buy what we need to buy, um, we've lost a lot of income. We've lost a lot of income from membership, from sponsorship, from uh, uh, fundraising through events. Obviously, we've not been able to, to get together as, uh, as a group uh, and, and run social events. So we're getting to the point, I think, where 
the idea of a part season is probably economically not viable because we've lost the income. But as soon as you start to properly open up the ground and use the ground, you're into end of season work that you have to then take on. So I'm not sure whether, whether the amateur game is going to get a proper run. Wealthy clubs might be able to make something happen if we get given the chance. But we're all really missing watching cricket. So I guess the question really to you guys, um, and there's been a little bit of an announcement around, uh, around some sports in the last few days, but what is the word on the streets about there being any professional cricket this year? And, and I guess the emphasis is probably going to be on the, on the sort of, um, should we say, higher interest limited over stuff. I guess the, the county season, the uh, county for, uh, format's gone, unfortunately. But, you know, what, what, what do you think, Paul? Do you think we're going to have a chance to watch some cricket? And, and in what sort of context do you think we're going to be able to see that live in the ground? Or is it, is it even viable to be doing it behind closed doors for you guys? Well, I, I, I'm not a medical expert and, you know, the same with Will. We, we're, we're very much governed by, um, you know, the, the government first and foremost and the ECB. The ECB are working very closely with the government. Um, the, the, I, I think there is a strong possibility that we will see England play some test matches this summer. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a good chance that will happen. Um, but there's a lot still to happen before we get to that stage. But I think there is a good chance England play. Uh, and I think from a county game, certainly the T20 competition is an important competition for counties, um, not only for bringing money in, but for getting people in watching the game. You know, and, and I think that's something that you know, there is a good chance. I think from a player's point of view, we, we've got to make sure that they're comfortable, they're safe, um, and they're happy to play. So, you know, Rosie, second part to you, um, if... If it was to come that way and we were to play some T20, do you think the players would uh, would embrace that and get behind that? I think so, yeah. I think anything to get out of the house at the minute is probably, um, you know, a goer for everyone. You know, like you say, T20, it's, you know, what people, what brings sort of the money through the door at the minute, isn't it? So I think, you know, that would be the competition that would be, you know, suited to, to us playing, um, you know, speaking to the guys. Um, a lot of the players this week, you know, they just want to get out and play play some cricket, whatever happens really, you know, whether these restrictions get lifted, whether that means you can throw balls at each other, who knows. But, um, you know, I think the first thing is to get out and, and hit balls and, and bowl or catch or whatever. Um, and yeah, try and try and get some cricket towards the end of the year if, if possible. You know, I think the beauty with the T20 comp is that you, that you can almost get it done in a month, can't you? So, um, you know, the the later we start is, isn't too much of an issue but you know we want to obviously get a good quality competition in and you know obviously put a, you know stand a good stand a, a good chance of you know at least winning some games this year fantastic uh, have we got any other questions no one's got a hand up there's anybody questions if you want to just unmute yourself and ask a question then fire away hi, <coughs> hi paul i've put one nathan in, how uh... are you going right go All for right. it well, I put one in chat actually in response to Steve's ah, point. Did you? I haven't found chat. Right, go on. Whilst you're, do you want to? Oh, I've got seven in there. I apologise. All those that put question in, I apologise. Yeah. Come on, Nath. It was just, it was just in response to Steve's point. Is that you know, in terms of amateur cricket, I'm a scorer, so obviously I'd have to socially distance massively, as you because obviously you're in a tight situation, but obviously the umpires as well. Most umpires, especially at amateur level, are older. So, you know, they're going to be extremely vulnerable. So, you know, what on earth are we going to do there? It's not so much a question, more as just a discussion point, really. Well, it's a good point. And let me tell you, there's one or two scores that I've seen with teams I've been with. And I reckon their colleagues would have been grateful of the social distancing and being on the other side of the ground. So... <laughs> uh, I'm sure that's not the case with you, Nathan, in any way, shape or form. But I bet that... And look, they are the things we've got to take into account. Yeah. You know, it's all very well, yeah. you know, we had the social distancing. But, you know, I saw Joe Root talking the other day. If Silly Point can't stand under the batsman's nose or the keeper can't stand up, it makes a bit of a mockery of it. And if the yeah. game can't be played properly, then it, it is an issue. You're absolutely right. You know, in club cricket, so many umpires are older. There's, an old, yeah. there's a lot of 
you know, you're obviously a bit of an exception. There's a lot of older scorers as well. That tends to be the way you can't play, you umpire. So we have yeah. to think of everybody. You know, yeah. we, we genuinely have to think of everyone. So, uh, you know. I mean, that, I am younger, but I am, I am clinically vulnerable to the virus. So it, it's, a, you know, it's another yeah. thing of having to think about. I Definitely. Mean, so it's one of those where, I mean, ask, ask Richard Evans about whether he'd want to be the other side of the ground from me when I was scoring. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Nay, no, thanks for the question. Mark. We've got one here from, yep. I found the questions now. We've got one here from Tom at King's Heath. Rosie, you can, um, you can answer this one. What's yep. the pipeline looking like for young players coming, into, uh, coming through the Warwickshire system? Rosie, what have you got for us? Yeah, I think I think it's exciting. I think it's it's really really exciting after last year. You know, I think we I think it's obviously well documented. We struggled last year, but what did come out of it last year was a lot of young players getting exposed to high quality cricket. You know, someone like you know Belly getting injured gave the opportunity for Rob Yates to come in and, and play all year. Um, Six hundred runs. It might not seem like a great deal, but for someone who's nineteen years old and never played a first team game in his life is. Is pretty impressive. Um, you know, got gets hundred. You know, Matt Lamb peels out one seventy against the the, uh, the country's best attack, um, and was probably the only one who played Simon Harmer well all year from any any club. Um, so that's exciting. And then obviously we've got the two Brooks boys who, you know, with a little bit of sort of mentoring. You know, it's it's very you know nice to see how far they can go. Um, you know, two very exciting talents. So we've got there's four players straight off the sort of the back who are all sort of 21 and under. You know, we've got a couple of lads who are 22, 23. Sam Hayne has played a lot of cricket now, but still only 24. So, you know, Sibber's 24. So it's, it's very exciting to see what is, you know, beneath us. Um, you know, I'm only 25 and I'm, I'm sort of in the top 10% or 15% of the sort of elder people in the dressing room now, which is quite strange for a county setup. So, um, you know, that's nice to, you know, nice to see these sort of youngsters and, um, coming through and, and taking the opportunity. Just tell me a little bit about Yates. I mean, obviously, I, I've seen him up close, and, and I'm sure there'll be people on here that have seen him as a kid coming through. What 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 caught your eye when you first watched him play? Um, I think he's very similar to someone like Gary Balance. He's very mentally tough. Uh, not much phases him. You know, I, I was batting with him a lot this year, and he and he copped his fair bit of abuse um, from a lot of teams. Probably because he just stands there and doesn't say anything. He's very quiet. He's very, he keeps himself to himself. And, you know, he's, he's a very different to someone like an Adam Hose who, you know, if you watch him walk around, you can understand what, probably why he cops a bit of abuse as well. So it's a bit unfair on, on, on young Yatesy to get any. Um, but, yeah, he's, he's, you know, very mentally tough. He's, he's 100 against Somerset with, you know, the two Overton just going at him for two sessions. Um, with the ball and with their math was just you know you know pleasure to watch you know a young kid sort of dominate you know some good bowling so um, it's always nice when you come you know come off the field you know I'm very close with Jack Brooks who played in that game um, for Somerset and you know for him to go that year it's will be a good player for someone who's played the amount of cricket as Brooks he has um, to for him to say that about a young kid at your club is you know is very nice and you know obviously. Fair play to Yates for getting that admiration so young. Yeah, no, excellent. I mean, Alistair Cook, um, when we played against them last year, I mean, he was equally, you know, keen to find out about Yates and said how impressed he was uh, with him. And you're right, there's, there's some very good talent coming through. Um, we're we're going to go a bit light-hearted here. Um, Luke has asked the question about, um, for, uh, for both of us, how are we keeping the, uh, the group together? without the banter of the dressing room. And I think it would be fair to say, you know, the WhatsApp group has been full of good banter. There's yeah. been a few um, quizzes flying around. We, we've, uh, um, we, we've had a, a Monday lunchtime get together. We've had a guest join us for the last, what, four Mondays. Um, yeah. And we won't give too much away other than that we've had a former Premier League manager, two current Premier League managers, and... Um, a former captain of England cricket team, and we're going to a um, an overseas international cricketer next Monday. So we have been doing things, but I mean, there's some in our group that they just don't get banter, do they? I mean, there's they don't have much when it comes to sense of humour. Um, yeah, there's a few weirdos, isn't there? There is a few strange. <laughs> 
I think I think what lockdown has given a lot of people, you know, it probably happened in your families is a few few stinking haircuts. Um, so we they did get um, a little they a little bit of bad in the first couple of weeks. Matt Lamb, Liam Norwell, Ollie Stone. Um, yeah, they they copped a little bit, didn't they, in the first two weeks, which which is always good fun because you know whenever you can get one over on Stoney, you know he's going to bounce you in the net, so you may as well take him down about his lid or his ears or something like that. So um, yeah, that was quite pleasurable. <laughs> there you go. Okay, from Howard then in Nuneaton, um, and again for both of us, um, he's asking about a really positive learning experience we've had um, and why it was a positive learning experience. While you're thinking of yours. I, yeah. I, and I'll give you a bit of a, a breather if you want to have a sip of your drink or whatever. But I, I'll give you a good learning experience I had. And I mentioned him earlier. I mentioned Sangakara. I'd been in Sri Lanka about nine or ten months. And Sangakara was batting in the nets in Colombo. And I um, was watching another net. And one of the bowlers said, oh, Paul, Sanga wants, wants you in his nets. So I went down. I said, what's the matter? He said, just watch my feet. I'm just trying to watch my back foot movement. Just watch it for me and, and let me know in a, in a few minutes what you think. I said, no problem at all. So I started to half watch, but I was more interested in another lad batting in another net. Anyway, I, was, I could hear Sanger was hitting them well. He looked pretty good. He looked pretty composed. Anyway, he called me down. So I went down. He said, tell me about my left foot. I said, your left foot, very consistent. Move the same time, same way, every ball hitting it nicely, your balance is looking really good. And he just stared at me and he said, I deliberately moved my back foot in a different way, five or six times in the first seven or eight balls. He said, next time I ask you for honest feedback, give me honest feedback, don't just tell me what you want me to hear. And I said, yeah, you're right, good lesson learned. And I came out of the net and it was a massive lesson learned for me that when a player wants something from you as a coach, you've got to make sure you're on it. And he was testing me out to find out about me. So it was a good lesson. And uh, as I say, as a coach, I learned a lot there about managing people. So, Rosie, have you got one for us? Yeah, I think, um, I think obviously, probably on the theme of, you know, top draw overseas players, you know, being at Yorkshire, I remember a net session um, and me, obviously, you get a couple of bowlers bowling and there was me and Steve Patterson bowling at Aaron Finch in one of the nets. Um, and you know I was fully re- loose ready to go ball the first ball What I don't know what happened probably whacked it threw me my ball back Steve Patterson wasn't to bowl so he just jogged in off three or four yards um, Aaron Finch just stood out the way let it hit the bat net and threw it back to Pato and just walked down and went mate if you're going to run in off three yards don't bother um, you know this is my time to bat so I want proper bowlers bowling I think you know I think we've taken that pretty well you know to Warwickshire I think um, you know, the net is is almost like boring. It's it's sort of like high intensity. If you're not going to do it, you know, 100%, and there's no point doing it all. I think I've taken that into my training. Um, you know, if I see someone who's bowling at me and, you know, I don't think, you know, the put apps actually put it in, it's, you know, whether you tell them after, um, you know, and I think it's a good learning for them. So I think that's what I've taken is, is that training is just important as a game, really. Absolutely right. Tom at Kings Heath, we've got one for me here, which is the difference between working on international and domestic stages. Very simple, Tom. You get the best players in the best facilities, best conditions, and you have more time with them. And as Rosie alluded to earlier, the, the best players, you're not necessarily talking about technique so much as more the, the mental side of the game. So you're, you're looking to make sure you're taking pressure off Sometimes in county cricket, you're ramping the pressure up a little bit and you're trying to put people under a little bit of pressure in practice. In, in, in international cricket, it's about taking the pressure off. It's about asking good questions. You don't necessarily have to have the answers, but it's about asking good questions. And I alluded to earlier, it's about knowing the people you're working with. Every player, and I guarantee every player, needs something different from you. But you've got to know what it is that they need from you. And I'll give you one little example. Stuart Broad, I missed the first week of a trip to South Africa. We've been to Pakistan, I've been to play Pakistan in the UAE for two months. We came back and I had an extra week in England, went out to join the squad in South Africa. And I'd been there about a day and we had a net session. And at the end of the net session, Stuart Broad came up to me and said, 
thanks for today. You're the first person since I've been in South Africa that said, well done. He said, that means a lot to me. Thanks very much. And the lesson learned was that even the blokes who are, you know, honed internationals, played 100 test matches, they still need a bit of love and attention. They still need you from time to time to remind them they're good players. They still need that little bit of love. And as I say, it doesn't matter who they are, every player needs something from you. And the big difference between county cricket and international cricket, as I say, you've got generally you have the best facilities, but you've got more time. You've got more time to prepare for games. You've got far more time to get to know your players and you've got far more time to actually for them to work on their games. But as I say, majority of them know the answers. County cricketers, yeah, they definitely get to that stage where they know their game. And I've asked many players, county and international players, at what age do you reckon you knew your game? Graham Thorpe told me he knew his game at 21. Mark Rampakash told me he knew his game at 28. Now, Thorpe, he got his game worked out. He knew his practice. He knew his game. Ramp said it took him longer. Um, Ramp's played till he was 42. Got 100, 100, 115, 114 first-class hundreds. Um, Thorpe, he had obviously a better international career in terms of games played. Um, but it's it just an interesting example of how different people um, different people learn at different times. So that would be my simplistic take on that. Um, here we go. We've got some more questions. Let's keep going down this scroll. Here we go. Um, Will, here's a good one for you. What persuaded you to leave God's own country, as you lot call it, to come to Warwickshire? Why would you have left Yorkshire to come to Warwickshire? <laughs> Um, I think that the main the main thing was opportunity. Um, you know, I can remember having a chat with Ashley Giles, obviously who was director at the time, um, Jim Trout and, and Ian Bell, who was captain at the time. Um, you know, I played against Belly in a Yorkshire MCC game and, and lucky enough to get runs um, in, in that game. So you know, had a had a had a meeting with them, and they you know obviously said that you know they were looking for an opening batsman. You know, Ian Westwood had just retired, so. Um, you know, how would I fancy moving down to, to open the batting for them? And, you know, at the time I was only, I was bits and pieces cricketer at, at Yorkshire playing the old T20, the old first team of first class game. So I think having that real, the opportunity to get real consistent first team cricket was probably the main motivator. I think it was a very tough decision. You know, I think anyone who leaves a county, you know, they grow up at, um, you know, they've got family, they've got friends, um, you know, to leave that was, it was a tough decision. Um, but yeah, I think, it was something that I needed for my cricket. You know, I think sometimes you've got to put yourself first and your cricket first above everything. Um, you know, because you know, if I'd have stayed at Yorkshire, you know, I'd have probably been out of a job by now. So um, to 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 move and, and you know, about the bullet and move was was mainly for the opportunity. Um, you know, but obviously when you've got Ian Bell, um, someone who you look up to and someone who you you sort of dream about playing with, when you've got him telling you that he wants you to bat in the top four. Um, with, you know, himself and Jonathan Trott, who are also going to make up the top four, I think you'd be pretty silly to turn that down, really. So, um, yeah, that was, there was sort of, one. the first one was opportunity, and then obviously the chance to play with, you know, one of your heroes growing up is, is was probably the other, other main factor. Brilliant. That was from Mike Brooks. Thank you, Mike, for the question. Right, one, this is a really easy one for you, and I know the answer to this one straight away. Richard Evans wants to know, now that you're captain, are we going to see more of your bowling or is it a good excuse to hang the bowling boots up? Um, I mean, I, I would like to hear the answer that I think you're going to give. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I hope I'm not going to hear the second part. So tell us about your bowling. What's your plans now you're captain? Well, it, it can go one or two ways, can't it? You know, I have been practising with a new ball, but I don't think... Um, Ollian and Dolby and Stoney and people like that are going to let me bowl a new ball. But um, yeah, it's definitely something that I would like to do. You know, um, I like to, like to bowl more. You know, I wanted to bowl, you know, more in my first year, but, you know, we had such a good attack and, um, you know, lads, you know, cleaned up in, in Div 2, you know, but obviously last year injuries presented me with that opportunity to bowl. And, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, it was tiring, um, opening the batting and bowling, but, you know, I think, like I said to, like I've said before, you know, that's part and parcel of, you know, first class cricket. You know, you, you get sort of 10 years at this, so you may as well put your effort in now and, and reap the rewards later. And, and, you know, knowing that you've given it a good crack. So, yeah, definitely try and, try and, try and get some more overs in, whether it's the, 
the graveyard overs, I guess, from overs 70 to 80 on a, on a flat wicket. Probably, probably not those overs. I'll pile them off on someone else. You know, I've done enough of them. So, uh, I probably won't bowl them. But, you know, if, if, if the pitch is doing a little bit, you know, I'll, I'll definitely be tempted to get myself on, yeah. <laughs> Good answer. That's the answer I was hoping for. Uh, we've got one here from Bernie um, saying, what do we think about um, playing behind closed doors with no spectators? Bernie, the simple answer is, if it means that we get cricket played, then, uh, you know, that, that would be um, absolutely fantastic. Uh, we need cricket, Sky TV, obviously the deal needs for cricket to be played. But again, we reiterate it's got to be safe. But the one thing that people in England don't realise is in county cricket, first-class cricket around the world is played in front of very, very few people. Very few people, if at all. You know, I, I've been at state games in Australia if there's 20 people in the ground, I've been in New Zealand, the same thing. Um, we, we played a test series between Sri Lanka and India in Sri Lanka, three match test series. It was a test series that Ajantha Mendis burn, burst onto the scene. 29 wickets in three games. Sachin Tendulkar went into the series needing 110 runs to become the leading run scorer in test cricket. And he left 30 short in the three match series. And they had an unbelievable side, the Indians. Dravid, Tendulkar, Laxman, um, Ganguly. I mean, that, they had an unbelievable side. Absolutely ridiculous side. We had Jaya Sarir, Jaminda Fass, uh, Jaya Wardner, uh, Sangakara, Muralithran, as I say, Mendis. And if there were 100 to 150 people in the ground every day watching, I'd be amazed. And, and it was literally for the massive Indian television audience that the series was put on. And unless England are playing in a test match or one day around the world, particularly test match cricket, teams do play with hardly anybody in, in the ground. It's, it is unbelievable. It is eerie. Um, and so England supporters assume that every game is played in front of big crowds around the world. And it really, really isn't. We're so lucky in England. And the England cricket team is so lucky. But even county cricket, we get more people watching a county game than some international teams get watching a day's test match cricket. So to play behind closed doors, it will be strange for the England players. But if it means that it gets cricket on television, it gives us all something to watch, then fantastic. And I, you know, I've said I've, I've enjoyed watching the reruns of various games. But one of the things that gets me into sport and gets me excited is not knowing the result. And when I know that Stokes is going to get the over the line at Eddingley, because I've seen it 14 times already, or I know that... You know, someone's going to score in the 89th minute for Chelsea to win a trophy. As much as I enjoy it, it takes it away from me. So, you know, for me, it's about the unpredictability of sport. That's what dragged us all along. Jack Leach being there with Stokes here at Headingley last year in that test match. You know, that, that sort of stuff, that, that's what gets us all there. And I'm sure we're all in the same, uh, the same boat with that one. Uh, um, right, let's move on to another question. Here we go. Um, Ah, here we go then. So this is some shacks. You can answer this one, Rosie. Your best memories yeah. of playing junior cricket or practicing junior cricket at a lower level. Yeah. What would your best memories be? When did you start? How old were you when you started? Uh, I was I was seven. Um, I think anyone who has all the siblings, um, you know, probably was in a similar situation to me. My old man was the coach. And my brother was the under eleven captain. Um, someone drops out at 5.45 for a 6.15 start as it is for a lot of you know junior cricket you know wherever you are in the country so um, you know I, I peel along in my brand new Slazenger White it's probably what it was probably cost me three quid from Sports Direct that my mum got me um, so I went on you know the wherever you know these whites were, were huge I can remember the game um, I can remember who it was against um, you know you know for cutting my local local team on, on the on the local park you know up in Hull um, and you know, I can remember I can remember scoring my first boundary I made I made five on my first ever game and I was actually back with a girl at the time um, you know she she heavily outscored me at the time which you know I actually loved at the same time because you know it was I was just out there playing cricket I, I batted number eight um, which I thought was probably three too high at the time and you know I made five and I'm, I, hitting your first boundary was probably my greatest ever achievement. Uh, um, you know, I, it was it was obviously under eleven cricket. It was very much down the leg side, 
probably bounced four times and, you know, hit it to fine leg where, you know, everyone <laughs> was sitting. So that's, that's, that was my, you know, best memory of junior cricket, you know, seeing, seeing the cheer from, you know, everyone. Uh, and, you know, carry on uh, and playing. Fantastic. Right, a good one for you here. Um, this one's from Anthony Ingram, and he wants to know, other than a Warwickshire player, who's your tip for the top who's currently playing on the England in the circuit who's got a chance of playing for England? Someone outside of Warwickshire. Yeah, there's a, there's a, couple, of, there's a couple of good ones, isn't there? I think um, looking, looking on sort of the previous years, you know, if I was to... Name one quickly off the top of my head, I think, you know, I'd probably go back to Yorkshire, Harry Brook and Matthew Fisher, you know, you'll have seen Fish from a very young age where he fabs and, you know, he was very, you know, if, injury, if he was injury free, he'd probably be playing a lot higher than, than Yorkshire at the minute. I think, you know, I think those two are, are two outstanding talents just because I've seen them play from when they were 14. Um, even younger in Fisher's case, probably more 10, 11 um, to where they are now. I think they would be my, Two players outside of outside of Warwickshire, um, probably to look out for in the county season, whether we get playing this year, next year, or or whenever it gets going. But yeah, those two players, Harry Brook and Matthew Fisher, I think. What about anybody other than Yorkshire? I know obviously Warwickshire and Yorkshire. I know you Yorkies. Yeah. You know you, you're very much about Yorkshire. But what about someone else? Um, somebody else out there? Anyone that uh, perhaps yeah. only played a few games? The first class cricket that you think actually um, people won't have seen a lot of. I think I think there's a the, the lad at Durham is it Briding Briding Cast the quick yeah. bowler yeah um, he he's very exciting um, he bowled us in the one day game I think last year at Edgebaston and bowled quickly um, and he's sort of popped on the scene out of nowhere I've played a couple of games with him I think he he might be of South African um, origin or something like that but. You know, came over very young and, you know, bowls good pace. So if there's anyone, I think he's played on the lines this winter, hasn't he? And he has impressed. So if there's probably anyone, you know, outside of the, you know, my home county now in Warwickshire or my home home in, in Yorkshire, you know, it'd be, it'd be him. You know, he's, a, you know, he's exciting and, and, you know, anyone who bowls quickly um, and if he can stay injury free, is, it will be very exciting. Fantastic. Um, ben Hughes says he's got a question, but he doesn't know how to put his hand up on the thing. So, Ben, do you want to unmute yourself and ask you a question? I can't, uh, I can't allow technology to beat you tonight. Yeah, no worries. It's a nightmare. I uh, don't have a clue. I'm don't thinking, worry, Ben. So, you're, you're, need some work on it. No, we're all the same, so. Yeah, it's all good. Um, so, yeah, I've, I'm a training sports psychologist and um, also... This is definitely uh, for you, Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa. I hope there's not too much stigma. Um, yeah, so, no, 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 it's good. No, yeah. good. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about um, at like the team level. So this is more for uh, for Will. So how do you create a cohesive and open um, sort of environment? But then at the sports system level for you, um, Paul, how do you create that sort of open and cohesive environment as well? And I also wanted to ask about how do you learn from the mentally tough? Because you say about there's some obviously some fragile mentalities in a, in a cricket team and then some mentally tough. And how do you sort of make sure that everyone gets that mentally tough mentality? Do you want to talk about team bit first, Roji? Yeah. I think I think I think for me, I think to the best environments I've played in are the teams who are most honest um, with each other, with the peers. Um, you know, the, you can probably have it in any workplace where people, you know, might talk behind people's backs and not to the to the faces of people. You know, I've experienced it in certain dressing rooms. You know that I've played in, um, but the best ones I've played in are where people are open and honest, uh, open and honest with each other. And, I can remember a game, um, two examples, one at Yorkshire, we got beat, um, I think by Somerset at Scarborough and we were absolutely terrible and Dizzy sat us down in the, in the dressing room for about an hour and a half um, and basically just said, the floor is yours, when no one is leaving Scarborough um, until, t until you tell people what you think of each other. Um, and what you think of the performance and it was pretty, for me I was only 19 I think and, and for me to to tell Gailey, uh, who, you know, is a pretty formidable character, you know, Yorkshire legend, uh, basically that his, his shot was terrible or something in that game wasn't, wasn't ideal. Um, 
but you know I think that's when you that's when you learn and and I think the best thing is that no one takes you know it's a heart and uh, you're only doing it for the good of the team you're only doing it for you know the best what you know to move the team forward so um, if you can have those those conversations with you know senior players if you're a youngster or you're a senior player and have it with a youngster and build that relationship um, to being open and honest and having that environment where people can you know say things to each other and not take it to heart I think that's the best way that you know a team will move forward and you know, certainly that, you know, the side at Yorkshire was like that and, you know, no surprise that they won two two games. Um, probably the second one, the second one was when we actually had a team meeting, didn't we, Fabs, after one of the Hampshire game, I believe, last year. Um, you know, we'd started the season poorly um, and we had a team meeting and, and basically just said exactly the same thing. Open on this floor and, you know, it was quite, quite a nervous one to start with, but then once someone speaks, you know, you'll find that a lot of people speak um, and it does just take that one person to to make it sort of go. And, and, and when it does happen, a lot of things do get cleared up because, you know, you, you will have all experienced it in your workplace, you know, people talk behind people's backs and that's never healthy. And, you know, if you can go up to someone and say something about their game, which maybe is a slight criticism, but will help them, um, I think that's the best way you can go. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely right. And, and the one thing I would say from a, from a coaching perspective of someone bringing a team together, and I can give you good examples and bad examples, and I'll give you a brilliant bad example. And for me, it was I think it, it really helped me as a coach. I, I, my first job as a head coach um, was at Kent. Now, I'd been academy and second team coach there, gone off to Sri Lanka to be assistant, came back to Kent, first job as a head coach. And the, the first year, that phrase that gets trotted out in sport about coaches or managers losing the dressing room, I lost the dressing room because my behaviour, I wasn't aware of how my behaviour was impacting on everyone around me. And Rosie will tell you that I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm a bit of heart on my sleeve. You know, I, I'm a, I, I can be, you know, I, I love the fun and the banter of the changing room. And there are times where I think I need to just calm myself a bit because I'm getting a bit too involved but I'm very passionate about winning. I love winning. Um, I'm sure there's many players that have played in teams I've been in. I think I probably would have been better served in a dugout on the side of a football pitch than I would have been in a cricket ground. But, you know, it, it's, it, it's my passion and I want the team to win. I want players to win. And one of the things that I've had to spend time talking to players about is that I'm not disappointed in them. I'm disappointed for them because I know how hard they've worked to get to where they've got to. And, and me controlling my disappointment for them is quite tough for me. So, I, I, as I say, at Kent, the first year, I, I lost the dressing room because I was too emotional. I was too up when we won. I was too down when we lost. And I took things very personally. And the second year, um, I got the sack. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me as a coach. I was sacked after two years. Um, I had three months out of the game. I then went to Yorkshire as second team coach. And then from there, I went to Sri Lanka to become head coach. And I'll give you an example of how I tried to manage myself. When I went to Sri Lanka as head coach, I took a notebook with me and I wrote in the notebook the phrases that I might have uttered when we lost wickets or played poorly. So when I opened my book, rather than saying them out loud, I opened my book and I wrote phrases. And some days I opened my book and my phrase was there in front of me that I might have shouted out loud. And it actually made me smile to read the nonsense I might have shouted, but it helped calm me down. And over a period of time, I have calmed down a lot around players. But self-awareness as a coach, as a leader, is is vitally important because you can, you know, you can spend all your time building up the trust with your players, helping them to get better, trying to bring a team environment together. But you lose the plot at the wrong time, and you can damage all that good work. So you know, Rose is absolutely right. His thoughts in terms of the open and honestness. And I think for me as a coach, it's actually being self-aware of how your behaviour impacts on the team around you. And you can very quickly erode any good work that you've done. And, and that's an easy thing to get right sometimes. Does that answer your question, Ben? Fantastic. I've got no more questions coming up on the, uh, on the, on the chat. We've just, we get to, oh, we have, we've got one, look at this. Someone's jumping in with a question. With 10 past eight, there's a few questions about the, uh, the, the red and white rose, but we're going to stay away from Yorkshire and Lancashire. 
whoever that is is asking about red and white roses. Nathan, I think. So uh, he's obviously a Yorkie. And he's got his Leeds United shirt on. He keeps getting digs in about Yorkshire. But Nathan, I'm not coming back to you. I'm going to stay away from you because I can't keep talking about Leeds United. But it's 10 past eight. Um, Roji, thank you very much. To everybody that's joined in, sent questions, sat patiently and listened. I hope it's been a good hour. It's been great for us. It really has been great for us because, as I said at the start, one of the things that we all miss, and it doesn't matter where you play your cricket, at what level you play your cricket, let me guarantee you that every dressing room has the same characters at, at any level. They've just got different names. And every team has got the quiet one who sits in the corner with the dry comments that the timing's perfect. You've got the noisy ones that don't stop talking and, you know, every so often something good comes out. You've got the ones who don't say a great deal and you've got the ones who cop a bit more stick than others. But we all have the same dressing room. We all have the same fun. We all play the game for the same reason and we're all involved in the game for the same reason. Whether it's Nathan in his score box, whether it's Rosie Captain in Warwickshire, we're all involved in the game for the same reason because we love it. And it doesn't matter what level you get to. As I say, you never forget why you got involved in the game in the first place. It's because we love the game so much. We're passionate about the game. We care about the game. And as Rod Marsh said once at the England Academy when I was involved, we are only the current custodians of this game. It's our job to look after it, to nurture it, and make sure that it keeps going forward. Um, and for a bloke like him to come out with that, I thought was quite impressive. So, Rodi, anything you want to finish with? No, just um, just obviously the obvious, stay safe. Um, and, you know, obviously, hopefully we get out there and, and provide some cricket. But, yeah, for, like we've said all along, you know, um, health and safety is, is the primary thing. So, you know, stay safe to everyone. And, you know, hopefully we, we see you around, if not this summer, maybe next summer. So, um, you know, thanks for, thanks for tonight. It's been a pleasure. Fantastic. So thanks all. Um, hope we do get some cricket. Thanks for uh, for tuning in, um, listening in, whatever the uh, the phrase is. Thanks for your patience with us trying to find the questions. Eventually, uh, we got there. And, and thanks to the guys at the cricket board for inviting us on. Danny, thank you very much indeed for your hard work and putting it together. Andy, thanks for the invite. And uh, we'll see you all again at some point. And, and good luck if cricket does... Uh, does come about. All the best. Take care. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thanks, bro.